Good evening, everyone. My name is John Frank, and I'm the Vice President for EU Government Affairs at Microsoft, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Microsoft Center this evening. Uh, it should be a really exciting evening because it's the launch uh, for Tony Connolly's new book, Brexit in Ireland, The Dangers, the Opportunities, and the Inside Story of the Irish Response. Um, this is our, we've, we have a book series, and so we've set up this room more as like bookshop, uh, but uh, you know, it's great to have you here. Um, we'd like to thank Commissioner Hogan for joining us, and Ambassador McBean, I Oh, here we are. Welcome. Uh, and Philippe Blanchard of Brunswick Group. Um, for Microsoft, Ireland's a really special place because it's been our operation financial center for since we came to Europe. Uh, we have 2,000 employees uh, in Dublin, and we're continuing to grow our workforce very rapidly. Um, we've also made it our data center capital uh, for Europe, and our, we've invested literally billions of dollars in our, our data center capacity, which is made available because of the very good work the Irish government's done creating the, the, correct, the, the best infrastructure. And then there's that magical element of cool Irish air, which means we never have to spend money con air conditioning our facilities. In addition, LinkedIn, uh, part of Microsoft, has over 1,000 employees uh, based in Dublin. Uh, just last week, uh, we announced a major wind energy uh, deal in Ireland where, where with GE, we're creating a very large-scale wind energy project. The key innovation it is we're also investing in batteries so that, because winds peak, I think there was a fairly windy day today, um, and and so uh, windmills peak and generate more electricity than the grid can take. Uh, and so by creating a battery buffer, uh, we make it more available uh, in, a, in a more consumable way. So, um, so at Microsoft, we're thrilled to, to have an Irish event here. And uh, we're thrilled to have all of you with us. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Commissioner Phil Hogan, uh, is the European Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, and in this capacity ensures that the EU agriculture and rural development policies promote growth and new jobs. Um, Commissioner Hogan previously served in the Irish government as Minister for the Environment and as a member of the Irish Parliament. Commissioner Hogan, thank you for being with us today, and please join me in welcoming Commissioner Hogan. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, Ombudsman, MEP, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here this evening to help, to help out in launching Tony's excellent book. I've met a number of people who have already read the book and they said it's a very good book, so uh, I'm sure that all of you will come to the same conclusion in due course. I've read bits of it myself. <laughs> and uh, it's a very welcome addition to the Brexit ecosystem. Uh, there's not a day passes, but there's not a conversation about uh, this particular matter around here. It's a bit like Roy Keane or the black card in Gaelic football. It's a subject upon which people's views are strong and they're heard strongly and loudly. So there's a lot of noise around this issue, as I say, but therefore it's critical that we have accurate, fact-based reporting during this politically sensitive time. Uh, we live in an era of fake news, and it's no exaggeration to say that 40 years of non-stop fake news in the UK, Eurosceptic media was a, a major contributing force to the Brexit referendum result. And I am certain that this book will become an important reference point. Perhaps there might have to be a sequel to it, Tony, at the end of the process, but certainly you've captured all of the various moods and opinions at the moment uh, as part of this process. Anyone who saw Tony's article in the Irish Times, which is based on extracts from the book, uh, can see how forensically researched and politically astute his analysis is. So while I welcome more common sense scholarship on Brexit, I fear that in the UK debate common sense left the building a while ago. Unfortunately, facts and details are derided by the Brexiteers. 
at a time when all the talent and energy of British politicians should be focused on delivering a good result in the London-Brussels negotiations, the unfortunate reality is that the London-London negotiation is still going on. And we have now missed the October deadline, in my view, for moving on to the next phase. Only serious engagement and realism can deliver an agreement by December. And what, hap what becomes more obvious day to day is that the Brexiteers are hooked on brinkmanship and have been since the beginning. Unfortunately, their only approach is the tough guy approach. But no matter what Brussels says or does, no matter what business in the EU says or does, no matter how many companies announce plans to move workers from the UK to new European Union headquarters, the hardliners cannot get it out of their heads, the idea that if they bully their way towards the wire, the union's nerve will crack. And they need to get it into their heads that this is not the way that the European Union works. And then the EU negotiators reflect the views of not just the European Commission, but very much the views of the 27 other member states, the views of elected governments, and the views of members of the European Parliament, who mandate the Commission in relation to the negotiations. Uh, unfortunately, we're now so close to the cliff edge of a hard Brexit that we can see the drop almost in front of us. And we have to hope that between now and December, that other voices will be louder and heard, and that managed Brexit will re-emerge as a credible option. From an Irish perspective, we have to be vigilant. Uh, protecting Ireland is one of the top three priorities uh, of the negotiating text, and this didn't happen by accident, and I, I know there's a lot of people in this room who've played their part in ensuring that this was the actual outcome in respect of the negotiating guidelines for phase one of the Brexit negotiations, for which we are very grateful. We owe political people, civil servants and our diplomats a great debt of gratitude, and we can't rest on our laurels, and I know that nobody is. It's painfully clear that the UK government is not going to propose workable solutions for the benefit of the island of Ireland. Indeed, the low priority afforded to Northern Ireland by London is very disheartening. We hear regularly about the need for a frictionless border, but the only policy positions outlined thus far would achieve the exact opposite. And a hard Brexit would hit cross-border trade hardest of all. And in his book, Tony describes the seamless north-south trade flows which currently exist in the dairy sector and how these are threatened by the political and or by the potential reintroduction of a hard border. Mr Barney saw this reality for himself, not for the first time uh, during this year but um, indeed over many years where he has a very keen interest in during his time as in charge of structural funds and the peace and reconciliation fun fund. He is uh, certainly somebody that understands the border region better than most around here. It is imperative, in my view, that two things must happen and happen fast. The first is that the Belfast Executive needs to assume its urgent responsibilities and reach an agreement. It is not acceptable at the moment that the representatives that are elected by the people of Northern Ireland have not brokered a deal to get back into Stormont because we need political structures there. I met somebody from the Scottish Parliament today and they talked about devolved powers being removed from Scotland and Wales to England as part of the legislation that's going through the Houses of Parliament. So therefore, we need to resist this, but also Northern Ireland needs to resist it, and it needs a political vice uh, in order to ensure that this vice is heard in relation to these particular challenges for devolution in Northern Ireland. Once the Assembly is up and running, Stormont and Dublin need to revitalise the North-South cooperation structures and make them function better and faster than ever before. There will be structures required to implement any particular outcome. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. The systems are in place, but they can only make a contribution if the political will and energy is there. So these fora can serve as a warm house for discussing potential solutions to the problem of a hard Brexit. And we, we need to remember that this is not just an Irish problem. It is a European problem in Ireland. Peace in the island of Ireland is not just an Irish, British or Northern Irish achievement. It's a European achievement. And safeguarding that achievement is not just a, an Irish, British or Northern Ireland obligation, it's a European one too. So let me conclude by again congratulating Tony on his excellent research, his great work and the credibility that he gives to the process by putting on paper for all of us to read what is going on. Because I know that in my position and indeed uh, MEPs I'm sure and indeed others in political circles are asked what is going on. 
So Tony now has the book to tell you what is going on. So buy it and read it, and then you'll know. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Philippe Blanchard. I'm the managing partner of the Brunswick Group in Brussels. I have the privilege of welcoming you tonight uh, and trying to uh, moderate uh, the debate. Uh, you will have time for Q&A a bit later, but I need to provide first uh, the official introduction to Tony for those of you who don't know him. I assume you do all know him, but let me go to, uh, to the motion. So Tony is editor uh, for RTEs, Ireland uh, Public Broadcaster. He's been covering EU and European affairs for Bru in Brussels since 2001. He's reported extensively uh, on the period before and after the Brexit referendum, and obviously will continue to do so. And before that covered the European refugee crisis, the Greek crisis, which may be an inspiration on this, by the way, uh, the Irish bailout and the financial crisis dating back to 2008. He's the recipient of two ESB National Media Awards, a European Journalism Award and a New York Festival's Radio Award for his radio documentary on the Shotcard Donetsk Football Club. So he does other stuff than politics, he does football too. He's also worked for the Irish Independent, Time Magazine and United Press International. Uh, the book we're discussing tonight is his second book. He wrote another book called Don't Mention the Wars, A Journey Through European Stereotypes, which, in which I'm sure the French are doing superbly well. <laughs> so I'll read that later. Um, so it doesn't need any further introduction. I'll pass the floor to Tony for his co comments, and then we will go through a Q&A session. Thanks very much, Philippe. Uh, Commissioner, Excellency, uh, Ombudsman, uh, MEP, and great to see so many friends and colleagues here. And uh, there's an Irish passport for everyone <laughs> before, they, uh, before they leave tonight. Um, so I, I, I got contacted by Penguin in February and asked, uh, well, it was an email saying, C can you contact us? And I, I had a sense of dread because I, I kind of felt they might be interested in, uh, in me writing something. And uh, myself and, and Rika had just had a small baby and I thought that's probably the worst possible thing that I could uh, ever get involved in. Uh, Rika thinks uh, it was and is. Uh, but anyway, we, we persevered and I'd like to thank uh, first and foremost Rika for her patience and, and through, through three or four fairly difficult months to, to get the book finished on time uh, and on deadline and then the, the following uh, editing phase. But I think uh, Penguin had the idea that, that there was a hunger in Ireland for um, straightforward facts about Brexit. How would it affect the ordinary person stuck in the M50 uh, in, in, in the morning? And I, I could see that, that you know, I, being in Brussels, I had, you know, obviously insights that the knowledge of how the EU works. But I, I also felt that there was a fascinating uh, story around Ireland's diplomatic response because it put us, uh, for the first time in years, uh, adjacent to the United Kingdom, and it, it, it posed a very, very difficult challenge diplomatically for the Irish state. Um, I then, once I started to look at what the implications were for all the sectors in Ireland, I, um, I had to look at the, at the agri-food sector, and then you start to realise that there has been a quiet miracle in Ireland, uh, not to do with uh, high tech, uh, present company notwithstanding, um, or, or to do with uh, pharmaceuticals, but to do with the food industry. And um, I discovered that uh, in, in the 1980s, uh, Britain was a major exporter of mushrooms, but th for, for various social reasons, that sector was taken over by Irish uh, farmers in, in, in Ireland, and they now produce 110,000 tonnes of mushrooms every year, with the biggest exporter of mushrooms per capita in the world. But it's one of those sectors which is um, high volume, low margin. So um, just in time deliveries are absolutely essential. So they were immediately affected by Brexit, not just in terms of um, the, uh, the, the, the collapse in sterling or the slump in sterling, but also in terms of how they would have to manage with uh, customs checks in the future because it's such a just in time uh, industry. Um, so I, I then wanted to see where we first in Ireland became aware of Brexit. It went all the way back to the Bloomberg speech in 2013 by, by David Cameron. There was a certain kind of unease, uh, I think, within the Irish uh, government uh, at 
at the prospect of, uh, say, let's say, turbulence um, regarding Britain, but nobody ever believed it was going to actually happen. So the book opens on the night of the vote. It opens uh, in Ukrep in, 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 in Brussels, and the sense of shock that was filtering through that evening. And then it switches to Dublin, where there really was a sense of, of shock, but also real fear, because Ireland was going to be, par excellence, the most exposed country uh, to Brexit. Um, it was also interesting to see how the Irish government had, had lobbied in the UK during the referendum. Um, I mean, uh, Dan Mulhall, the Irish ambassador, uh, all but campaigned openly for a Remain vote. Enda Kenny made a, lo a lot of visits to uh, the UK. Uh, it was all going great until that moment uh, he went to a Mayo versus London GAA match. And uh, one Mayo fan with a big Mayo sweater was interviewed by RTE and he said he was going to vote leave because he was sick of all the immigrants uh, coming into the UK. Uh, so that's uh, somewhat punctured the, um, <laughs> the, the, the campaign. Um, but then, of course, we, we, you, know, you, you had to look at the numbers, the, the huge volumes in trade that, that flow between Ireland and the UK. And actually, interestingly, not just in agri-foods, but also in services. Uh, and if there's anybody here who can tell me what the tariffs are on IT services you know, post-Brexit, I'd, I'd love to talk to them, because uh, that's one of the things that, that is just going to be very complicated. Um, obviously, the Northern Ireland is, is a major issue in Brexit uh, from all sorts of angles. Um, the Good Friday Agreement is underpinned by not just EU funding, but a shared space in which the tribal and constitutional complexities can find uh, breathing space. Uh, and it also provides, or provided at least, a space of prosperity on the island of Ireland. And I think the worry is that Brexit challenges and confronts all of those things, uh, possibly to a, a very dangerous degree. Uh, so this placed the Irish government in a uniquely difficult situation right after the referendum. And, of course, you had layers of bilateral uh, relationships between the two countries that, that went back hundreds of years. They, they were sharpened during the, the troubles in Northern Ireland. And then they, I suppose they found uh, a, a level of peace through the Good Friday Agreement. And the relationship was probably not was was at its highest uh, when, when Queen Elizabeth visited Ireland in 2013, I think it was. So that um, that apogee of, of of a close bilateral relationship has suddenly been shocked by Brexit. And you can see at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, the Irish government had to uh, slowly but very deliberately diverge uh, from London. All of those bilateral uh, cultural, historical links uh, had to take second place to Ireland's position in the EU. And I think that's been a very challenging thing for the Irish government, not, not just uh, in terms of statecraft, but also in terms of the relationships that had built up for years between diplomats, between officials. Every year there's a, there's a summit meeting between all of the secretary generals in Ireland and all the permanent, permanent secretary gen secretaries in the UK. They come together for uh, a, a week of meetings on common ground. And that has to be complicated by Brexit uh, because there is a potential adversarial uh, relationship now between the two countries. Um, I, I learned more than I ever dreamed I would learn about the dairy industry, about cheddar cheese, how you make cheddar cheese. Um, I was told that there are hundreds of thousands of, m hundreds of millions of litres of milk cross the border every year, back and forth. And of course, the, the journalist in me wanted to know why that was the case. Um, so I did some deep dive research into the dairy industry, which I'll, I'll spare you all uh, this evening. <laughs> but uh, some standout facts, Bailey's Irish Cream, the, the globally famous Irish brand, it has 5,000 border crossings every year, whether it's milk or cream or bottles or corrugated uh, uh, paper. And all of those crossings are now potentially uh, a challenge uh, post-Brexit. Brexit, uh, Bailey's also uses 5% of the Irish milk pool. 5% of the Irish milk pool goes to making Bailey's, which leaves only 95% for cornflakes. <laughs> um, I also learned about the beef market. We, we sell 270,000 tonnes of beef to the UK every year. That's 2.5 billion euro worth. And the, the other thing I learned, apart from Bailey's and, and, and uh, milk powder, is that, that that market has been carefully 
um, carefully forged over, over about a 20 year period. After, I suppose after the trauma of the Beef Tribunal and then in the UK there was the BSE scandal and uh, foot and mouth and suddenly Irish beef had a wide open market in, in the UK. It's a high paying market and Irish beef is now almost seen as uh, synonymous with uh, UK beef and the big worry is that that market cannot be replaced overnight and that's going to be a major problem. I mean people talk about German car manufacturers putting pressure on Angela Merkel. I can think of a more formidable uh, lobby <laughs> in Ireland putting pressure on the government uh, when, when Brexit starts to get uh, tricky. Um, I'd like to finish this short um, talk by talking about the, the, the challenge to report Brexit. Um, I mean, th you know, the Bre Brexit is a story that consumes us every day mm. and uh, I think it's fair to say that people, journalists in Brussels are in a unique position in that, in that we follow the, the European story, we can navigate the institutions and we kind of know a good bit of the, the rules. And that means that uh, we, are, we are more likely to challenge stuff that you hear that you just know is not going to fly because it is against the, the rules. And we know that the EU is a rules-based system and that they think about things in terms of rules and the integrity of the sing single market. So it, it means it's a kind of somewhat asymmetric story to cover and, and that's a challenge because you know you still need to be balanced in the way you report this. Um, it also requires you know expertise that we never thought we would need, expertise on customs, uh, the issue of mutual recognition of authorized economic operators, WTO rules, tariffs, the third country inspection regime, uh, because I think people see Brexit in terms of customs and tariffs, but there is a whole world of regulatory um, harmonization out there that is going to be extremely challenging. Um, and I think finally, you know, uh, as a story, it, like we are really only getting into the, uh, the hard part. And you can see with the civil war and the Tory party in the UK, uh, the, the clear inability of the British government to find a settled position on Brexit that we are potentially facing a disequilibrium in this process and we've seen in Europe how, how that can be systemic and the damage that that can cause. So um, I, I think we're in for a rough ride but a fascinating ride um, and I, I hope that my book can, can make a, um, a contribution to that and I'm not saying anything about a sequel <laughs> right, right this minute. Anyway, I'd just, I just finally like to thank uh, Microsoft for hosting the event this evening. It's extremely kind of them. Um, a, a special thanks to John Frank, uh, who spoke earlier, and also to Philippe Branchard for making this event happen. Uh, and on the Brunswick team, who've been really helpful in the last few weeks organizing this, Isabel Dekester, Mike Wilson, Peter Kalutai, and then the Microsoft team, Gretchen Deo and Andrea Calbeaza. I think I pronounced that right. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy the book, and thanks very much for coming along this evening. Okay. Can we see you? Uh, oh, do you want to sit there? Yeah. Thank you, Tony. So I'll start the Q&A and then I'll pass it on to the floor, but I've got the privilege of asking the first two or three questions. Uh, the first one, I read the book, and uh, what struck me was the level of preparation of the Irish government ahead of the referendum uh, in the organization of poll, in the preparation of the communication strategies, they were ready to respond the day after. Um, and then they entered in a period where they tried to help the Brits put together their, their, their negotiation, actually what they asked should be. Do you think Dublin should, should and could still play a role in brokering a deal, considering where we are now? Um, I think that that, that was certainly the, the hope in the British side and there was a House of Lords report that was delivered in December last year and that was a result of the House of Lords carrying out very detailed hearings on Ireland and I th the reason being that some of the Lords had been um, agriculture ministers or fisheries ministers and had, a, had a quite a good grasp of Irish politics and they felt that Ireland had been completely neglected during the referen referendum campaign notwithstanding Enda Kenny's uh, efforts uh, in, in uh, in, in traveling around uh, the UK and uh, they, they felt that this should be uh, something that, that could be done and the report that they delivered suggested a bilateral agreement between Britain and Ireland um, that would sort out a lot of the issues and then th that that bilateral agreement could then go almost uh, to the EU 26 for, for a blessing but it, it was shot down almost immediately by the Irish government 
um, and quite brutally so, I think, at the time. And I think the Lords felt uh, quite disappointed that it, it didn't get more traction. Um, but you could see at that point um, the Irish government had realised and had been politely told, I think, by Brussels that, that their negotiation would happen through this city uh, and not bilaterally. And I, I think that was a hard thing for the Irish government to... Uh, to have to do because it, it went against the natural uh, inclination wi which would be to, to use the very very deep and natural bilateral channels that exist not just informally but through the structures of the Good Friday Agreement mm -hmm. and through this bilateral uh, re relationship that had been built up since uh, there, was, there was a summit uh, meeting in 2011 which established these yearly meetings of civil servants and so on. You and the book talks about the title of the book includes opportunities. We didn't discuss many opportunities until now. Where do you think they are? Are they economic opportunities? It's and what do you think is the big political opportunity, or is there one for? It's a short chapter. Um, <laughs> it's. Um, I mean, I, I think I think there are the, the obvious um, sort of more high-profile opportunities would be, of course, the financial services sector. Ireland has been lobbying very hard to get. Um, you know the, some of the um, standout financial services companies to locate to Dublin, uh, and obviously the, the two um, agencies, the, the medicines agency and, and the uh, banking authority. Um, I think I think Ireland struggles with certain issues on on infrastructure and uh, schools capacity. These are the things that are going to trip the, the process up. I think, um, but there there is a, a tremendous opportunity. I think for um, Ireland to position itself as the English speaking. Uh, jump off point for the single market. I think that is going to happen perhaps more slowly and in a, in a more quiet way than the uh, financial services uh, channel. Um, I mean, and there are there are lots of hidden uh, things that people may not think about. The, the whole question of uh, aviation, uh, cargo that goes to the United States from Europe, uh, there are treaties that govern that uh, cargo to make it comply with uh, American uh, safety standards. Uh, if Britain falls out of that regime, then c could that cargo be channeled through Shannon Airport instead? I mean, these are some of the issues that people are starting to grapple with. But I suppose it comes down to a kind of a blunt uh, question. Uh, you know, is there enough in the opportunities to offset the damage if, if there is a hard border and if, you know, the, the tariffs start hitting the, uh, the, the food sector? One point which is more common than a question that struck me in reading the book, it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it is forensic, as Commissioner Hogan mentioned, and I did learn a, a lot of things about the trade in cheddar cheese, but uh, it's also very human. And in this city, we tend to think a lot about macroeconomics and low, but we sort of forget the human dimension of this. And you mentioned your experience in interviewing people in Ireland. Can you talk a little bit about that? And when you want to see farmer, what do you hear? I mean, I, mean, I think... As a, as a journalist, you know, like it's it's drummed into you at a very early stage that that you need real people to tell a story, and um, because I'm in Brussels and not able to roam around Ireland, I spent a lot of time on the phone, just uh, ringing uh, farmers, uh, fishermen, um, entrepreneurs, and I found that everybody wanted to talk because people were confused and they were kind of almost reassured that they they were, they could talk to me and and get some answers or get some reassurance. Um, I think the most uh, one of the most memorable conversations I had was uh, when I was looking at the question of uh, European peace money. Uh, the EU has provided uh, close to a couple of billion, I think uh, it's in the book, but I'll, off the top of my head, it's a couple of billion in terms of peace and interreg and regional funds for Northern Ireland and the regional area. And one recipient of that was uh, a thing called the Theatre of Witness, which happened in my hometown in Derry, and it basically it was a an avant-garde American playwright who, who got a grant to bring uh, perpetrators and victims of the Troubles together in a dramatic setting, uh, get them to tell their stories, and then uh, through the telling of the stories to have this kind of cathartic, dramatic experience that was both cathartic for them and also from, for the audience. And it, for a couple of years in the, in the late 2000s, uh, this Theatre of Witness uh, w went all around Northern Ireland and had absolute sellout shows. And I spoke to uh, a young woman who, uh, she had been an IRA volunteer, and um, her story was incredible because she was on active service one night when she had a brain hemorrhage about to uh, take part in an ambush. And she went through her own personal purgatory over that, and then she ended up 
in this theater of witness with Kathleen Gillespie, who was the wife of a man in Derry who was strapped to a, a, a truck with explosives mm. and blown. It was, it was a notorious case. And she found herself, a former IRA woman, in a room with uh, the wife of this victim. Uh, and through this incredible dramatic process, they became best of friends. And this was financed by European money. Uh, and I think I, I felt it was worthwhile looking at the role that European money had uh, played in the peace process because I don't think it's it's fully comprehended it's in, in, in Ireland. Thank you. I will now open it to the floor. We have assistant in the room with microphone, so don't be shy. And Tony is all yours. Here, Connor. Um, I'll get the ball rolling, Tony. Um, uh, reporters love asking hypothetical questions, <laughs> so let me ask you one. Um, based on everything in your research and what you see from right now, do you see any prospect of Brexit being reversed? Ooh, um, are we on the record? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I think not in the short term. I mean, I think depend, depending on what happens in the Conservative Party, you could you could have a an unsustainable uh, situation in the Conservative Party where neither side is uh, has supremacy, and that there will be a leadership challenge. There'll be an election, and Labour will win the election, and we could be in a different ball game then. Um, but I d I'm not sure if Labour would be able to win an election on a pledge of reversing Brexit. But um, I mean, I've been told by people, uh, lobby correspondents in Westminster, that there's a very, very kind of fine balance that can be tipped in terms of public opinion when people start to feel it in their wallets that, that can actually make a big uh, dramatic uh, swing in terms of public sentiment. But for the moment, I think, I think we, there's definitely the potential for a lot more chaos and um, deadlock and unpleasantness, <laughs> shall we say, over the next few months. Uh, wh whether whether the, the aircraft carrier can be turned around so quickly, uh, it's it's pretty hard to say. Mio. Yeah. Dan Daniela first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Daniela Cucciano, I work for Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. I have two quick questions, if mm -hmm. I may. Um, jokes aside about the passport, we did read a lot of articles about uh, people getting Irish passports. And speaking of opportunities, I was wondering what you think of that being an opportunity for Ireland, having a lot more citizens in a way post-Brexit. Um, how could Ireland use that to its benefit? And my second question is, there's not a lot of examples in the EU where countries are as integrated or with as much history as the UK and Ireland. but. There are a lot of countries where we have populist ideas and where economies are integrated. So looking at Ireland and the UK, what is the lesson you think other governments need to learn about a similar situation that could happen elsewhere? Well, on your last question, in fact, the, um, the Irish peace process and the way peace money was uh, spent in Ireland was used as a as a best practice by the European Commission. And they, in fact, they took the example of the peace process and how it was funded by the European Commission and by the European Union. They took that to Colombia and they presented uh, projects in Belfast and Derry and Portadown to FARC guerrillas and their opponents in Colombia. I've just watched Narcos uh, last night and I'm not sure if, <laughs> <laughs> if it will actually really work, but um, uh, I mean, but. It, like that, th the way peace money was spent in Northern Ireland was was unique. It's it's a unique um, tranche of money that is spent in, in at a European level, and it has to be uh, rolled over each year. And each year, uh, all member states uh, agree to do this. Um, I mean, if if you're asking about the the relationship between Ireland and the UK, how, how that evolved over years, I mean, it was very very painful. And in fact, uh, before both member states were in the European Union, there was very little high-level contact between both sides. So there was a lot of megaphone diplomacy during the Troubles uh, for 30 years. Um, the relationship was characterized by deep suspicion and at times uh, hostility. Uh, and the European Union facilitated uh, the 
rapprochement, the, the, the warmth and the and the day to day contact. So I, I think, you know, it, it would be a real problem if that is lost because of Brexit. Um there are structures under the Good Friday Agreement um that keep that contact going. Uh like I don't want to overstate uh, the the impact of Brexit, but I think people are concerned about that. On the question of passports, I mean, there are plenty of members of the Department of Foreign Affairs here who will uh, <laughs> answer that question <laughs> better than I would. But uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's um, there's probably a little bit of pride in Irish people knowing that English people want to become Irish uh, through through a, <laughs> a grandfather. And I, I've, I've wondered, would, would Britain actually join Ireland and you would have the Irish Isles <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the Irish and Irish Lions uh, rugby team? Um, but uh, at the same time, um, it, it you know it 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 can pose pose its own particular problems if if a lot of people are you know claiming Irish descent and and, and getting passports. Uh, as I say, DFA people are here to on hand to uh, give you some uh, advice on that one. Mio, you have a question. Uh, thanks very much, um, Michal Crowher, Committee of the Regions. And uh, speaking about your last point, uh, I suppose we could have an Ireland section in the European schools where we would invite the Brits in, and that would alleviate <laughs> a lot of the difficulties as well. But uh, more seriously, I mean, there are uh, two small issues. One is, um, have we done or can we do more in terms of promoting the European Union in Ireland, especially through the storytelling? Um, do we do enough within that? And the second one then is that there is incredible coherence from the rest of the European Union in terms of its strategy. Um, but clearly Brexit is not the primary concern of a number of member states, whether it's mm -hmm. migration, whether it's rule of law, uh, big threats from a, um, a big neighbour from the east, which uh, I suppose we've all uh, felt it sometimes. But can you see any cracks in that? And how can the European Union ensure that coherence um, going through the negotiations? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think the problems that the European Union face uh, in Ireland are, are quite common in, in other countries. Um, you know, I, I kind of wonder how much do ordinary people in Ireland know about the institutions? Um, and it's, it's, no, it's no crime if you don't. I mean, like, uh, Irish people are consumed by domestic politics. It's, a, it's about health, education, you know, taxation. Um, but I think there is an emotional attachment to the European Union in Ireland that is absent in, in the United Kingdom. And, and that's always been the case for historical reasons. And I suppose one, one of the things that I, it's an interesting thing to do is to cover, is, is to be a European correspondent because you're not necessarily doing the kind of uh, he said, she said sort of adversarial uh, covering of two, two sides to a story. A lot of what we do is explaining you know, because it is complex, and uh, and I, I felt during the book again that, you know, I mean, I suppose as a journalist, you you feel like you you have this sort of instinct to want to explain to people how stuff works, because it's very easy for people to dismiss stuff because they can't understand it or it's complex. And I think the world has become more complex, and uh, because of all the competing constituencies, the world uh, requires more consensus and compromise. And I think when you're angry or feel that you're not listened to or you're um, marginalised, then people dislike that process. And I think we've, I think th in that way you have populism. I think that's probably the way populism thrives. So I think it's important to explain stuff. And uh, and you know I, I I don't know. I mean like through civics classes. I don't know because it's not just European. It's 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 the way politics works today. I think if, if people could see that it requires consensus and requires difficult compromises, then I think that, that would be important for the, uh, the acceptance of the political process. Um, the unity of the 27, yeah, I mean, I think that is going to be a big challenge uh, because um, it has held so far because it hasn't really been challenged. Um, and once you get into a, an amber light flashing, if there is going to be a no deal Brexit and suddenly you know, in, in this country, there are huge uh, volumes of trade from Flanders to the UK. I mean, those constituencies will start to want to be heard. And th and then you will start to get political heat. And that could melt away the some of the kind of glue that, that's that's holding this uh, unity together. Sure. We have one question over there. Well, well we have two then. Okay, uh, my name is Vincent Feiner. I work for Boeing, but I'm talking in a personal capacity. 
The good news about, and I apologise for my English accent <laughs> up front. <laughs> Not at all. But the name is in Feiner, spelled F-E-I-N-E-R. I had a far grandfather born in Dublin and also one in Lublin. And the funny old world is I was born in Antwerp, so I'm pretty <laughs> European. I like to loop back to the question that was asked here. I understand that Brexit is all-consuming, but I would just say as a UK person, and the only reason why I keep my UK passport is that I still may have another project, is only 37% of the electorate voted to leave. We know Scotland voted to remain. We know Northern Ireland voted <coughs> to remain. We know London overwhelmingly voted to remain. We also know, if you look at any European, there's a lovely website, A to Z of Lides, that have been put out by the British media since 1992, and it goes to pages and it starts with funding of African trapeze artists. But the point I'm, I'm trying to get over, I don't think this is necessarily a done deal. When the people in the UK wake up, to the fact they would like to. There is a huge opportunity to turn the tide. Now, I'm also a member of the Labour Party, and I know that Jeremy Corbyn has a particular ideological fix with uh, Europe. I understand that as well. But he also has a, a huge support of young people who voted overwhelmingly to remain. And anyone at the Labour Party conference would have seen that. So the, the idea that when you read about momentum, it's a huge Trotskyite conspiracy, it's a throwback to militant and all that. It's not. It's about, well, as you said, Tony, it's about young people who were disillusioned with politics and they rallied to Corbyn. But I doubt if Corbyn would actually alienate his core base. And therefore, the work that Keith Starmer does is excellent in terms of holding the, the ring during the Brexit debate. But when it comes down to what are they going to get from Europe, which is very little, which is what one expected, there will be another referendum, and I'm convinced that it will be turned around. Now, the question I put to you is how can Europe help that process without it being seen as fake news? And the absence, and, and I'm critical of my own company, that's why I said I speak in a personal capacity, the absence of business raising its voice in this debate. They're beginning to raise their voice, but it's up to business to raise their voice now about the serious consequences, not just to the economic implications of individuals, but also to the, the unity of Europe, because it's not just about economics, it's a political union, and we understand it, and it's guaranteed not only peace in Northern what, Ireland. What's the question again? So the question is, <laughs> well, no, I'm saying what can we do to reverse it? And that was the first question that was asked. And by the way, and I'll finish on this point, you want a sequel to your book. It's called Brexit, No Exit. Okay. Um, what can Europe... I, I think... Um, I think there, there, you know, there, there's a real narrative in the UK, and, and it's, it's people who are not quite um, saying that we have to just reverse Brexit, but they want a, a vote on whatever deal is done. Um, and you know, we, we've saw that over the weekend that there, there, that, that there could be the numbers in Parliament for, for something like that. But I just wonder, you know, what, what will the attitude in Europe be if Europe has been put through two years of agony of Brexit negotiations and at the end of those two years Parliament says actually we don't like the result? I mean, what is Europe meant to come back then and, you know, get, give more concessions or, or what? I, I, just, I just don't know how that process is going to unfold. I mean, there's, there's people here who would, who would have a more intuitive sense of that than, than I would, but... I, I, I sometimes wonder about that particular idea, um, and in, in a sense, Europe can't really look beyond uh, what Britain says it wants in this part of the process, and Britain hasn't really spelled out what it wants, apart from it doesn't want Canada, it doesn't want Norway, uh, and s s somewhere between Canada and Norway, it's a big distance, um, and... I think that's as far as we can go with it. With that particular we'll take one last question over there, that gentleman. Thank you, Matt Carty. I'm a Sinn Féin MEP, and I suppose 
Um, the, I want to make a point first, if I may, and that's just in relation to um, the Commissioner's point, because I saw heads nodding when he said that you know a pivotal point that needs to be reached is the re-establishment of the Executive in the North. And the point I want to make is, while absolutely it's our commitment that the executive be up and running, and it's essential that the executive be up and running for a whole um, array of reasons, people shouldn't delude themselves to think that that happening is all of a sudden going to create a single voice in relation to Brexit coming from the north, because effectively you would have an executive led by two parties with the exact opposite position um, with regard to Brexit. So we shouldn't delude ourselves that th that, that is in any way a panacea to the, um, to the border issues. Um, the question that um, I would have of Tony is with regard to the border issue and the fact that it is now currently a centrepiece, one of the three centrepieces in terms of the negotiating um, phase. Do you share um, I suppose it's a concern almost that I have that that issue needs to be addressed now in this current phase because if we don't have it, a definitive position from the British government in particular in relation to how we deal with their apparent desire for a, a frictionless and seamless border, if we don't actually have the agreements in place that will allow that to happen now, that further on in the negotiations, the other interests that you talked about coming from other member states will insert themselves into the discussion and Ireland will fall down the agenda. Um, thanks, Matt. I mean, I, I think um, I think the Irish government is uh, is is highly um, charged of the idea that the Irish question remains a uh, of equal weight and importance to the other two questions. Um, and of course, uh, the, the the one question that gets raised all the time is like, how can you possibly deal with the Irish border if you don't know the final trading arrangements? How can you get a sense of uh, customs and um, you know the regulatory framework uh, that that will actually dictate what kind of border you have uh, until you know the final outcome, um, and I think that's a hard question sometimes for the Irish government and, and the European Union to answer. Um, my understanding of of the thinking in Dublin is that uh, you need um, you, Brit that Britain really needs to spell out exactly how it is going to avoid a hard border uh, explicitly. And it's again, it's this idea of pushing the question back to London, not not that Dublin and Brussels has to answer the question. Um, and you know, the the question of the of the executive is key because I think Britain is going to be pushed into some uncomfortable territory in terms of constitutional arrangements, in terms of dealing with um, uh, food on an all island basis. Perhaps we we ran that story uh, last week. In, in, on RTE, um, and I think the, the echo that you hear about getting the executive back and running is because they want Northern Ireland to, to buy into uh, what may be a very difficult and controversial decision at the end. I mean, uh, this is my own speculation, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing that, that uh, British um, officials are not entirely um, averse to the idea of fairly radical solutions, if that's what it takes. They're not going to say it publicly at the moment, um, but uh, but I think th you know that is the is the direction of travel. And in terms of your question, can they do this now? I think I think the Irish government will want. Um, the, I mean, as as it was put to me, that, that they want those solutions to be uh, all weather proof. You know that they, if, if there's a commitment made in the next couple of months, that it will it will survive s uh, storm damage uh, into the future. Um, and and that, that but it, it is. I mean, it's 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 a tricky one for sure. Okay, we'll take one last one. Sorry, could you repeat that with microphone for yeah. people to, to hear? Are the radical solutions you think the British officials have in mind compatible with the DUP shoring up the British government? Um, that is a classically political question, and I think uh, it's the art of the possible. Um, and I think that um, I think that Dublin does see the occasional chink of light in in the DUP uh, kind of monolith, if you like. I mean, the, the the perception that I, as it's put to me, is that. The parliamentary party of the DUP is, is fairly hard line. They're enthralled to the Eurosceptic wing of the Tory party, but uh, quietly, the you know perhaps the agricultural wing of the DUP, known as the Ulster Farmers Union, um, <laughs> that they they 
they, they are perhaps looking a lot more soberly at, at, the, at the reality of what Brexit could do to uh, the Northern Ireland ag agri-food sector, uh, which, is, which is not pretty. So, suddenly I've got to, to stop it now, but th th the good news is that Tony's around, that they are doing some upstairs, <laughs> sit here and answer questions. that you can go and talk to him, uh, and you can even buy his book, uh, and he'll probably give you a signed copy. So, thank you very much all for attending today. Uh, it was a good discussion, and we shall all meet you upstairs now. Thank you.